uh, today the speaker is uh, Juan uh, Velasquez uh, Reyes, and uh, he is a student finishing up his uh, studies in Mexico, and he's interested in continuing with a graduate degree at Polytechnique. Uh, turns out our paths uh, bypassed uh, a couple of years ago. We were uh, both at a conference in Mexico in Guanajuato, but we just didn't meet. And uh, then he reached out, uh, expressing an interest to work on a topic related to quantitative MRI. So we agreed that he's going to spend a couple of weeks, uh, couple, sorry, a couple of months, uh, working on a QMR lab module for B1 mapping. And he uh, has been working closely with Matthew and uh, Aga as well. Uh, trying to come up with a uh, uh, notebook presenting uh, actual flip angle imaging for B1 mapping. Uh, and today is basically his chance to tell us the work he did, the challenges he faced, and where he wanted to take the work uh, further. So, uh, Juan, are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. So, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, it's good. Okay. Yes, today, uh, thanks for the introduction first. Today I'm going to talk about uh, an interactive tutorial for the actual flip angle imaging, a V1 method, uh, implemented on QMR lab. Uh, first, uh, for those who don't know me, I'm from Mexico, uh, and I was born in a little town at the south of the country named Tuxpan, Jalisco. It is a small town. But then when I was 18, I moved to Guanajuato to study engineering physics at the University of Guanajuato. And this is the city of Guanajuato. This is the main building of the university, this building in white. And as you can see, this is a colorful city uh, with lots of things to do. And Will you tell them about the mummies? Yes, yeah, the mummies. <laughs> that city, Guanajuato. So I don't know and if you've heard, uh, basically, will you, will you say about the mummies? Or I think we should, because it's really impressive. No, that museum is, is not in the city center. This is the city center, but it is in one part, but I'm not going to talk about the mummies. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just uh, say it then. It's basically a, a place where uh, the earth has preserved a lot of uh, corpses. And uh, you go in mm -hmm. there and you can view them and uh, it's kind of out of a horror movie. It's one of the weirdest places I have ever been in my life. <laughs> yes. So. And then, uh, four or five years later, I went to the main capital of the country, Mexico City. I was involved at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, uh, where I earned a degree in Master in Science in Medical Physics. Uh, and this is just an illustration of the campus. This campus is enormous, and it is located at Ciudad Universitaria in Mexico City. If you ever come to Mexico, you should have to go, you should go there and meet and to know this campus. It is very beautiful. Uh, but yes, after this little tour in two cities of Mexico, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, what we did. First, I want to say that Matthew has closely followed this, this work. He always helped me. And we have added a new field mapping method, known as the actual sleep angle imaging, or AFI from here on. And we implemented this method on the QMR lab software. This is just an illustration of what is uh, graphical user interface, interface using the AFI method and the protocol and the options uh, we implemented to in a in a module to fit the data and we also added a module to block simulations but before to go into greater detail first I would like to introduce what is B1 mapping then uh, I would like to explain some of the AFI theory and finally I would like to share my experience as contributor uh, so to begin with uh, in an MRI scanner, there is more than one magnetic field involved in the generation of an image. Uh, first, we have the main uh, magnetic field, which is used to align the nuclei within our bodies, for instance, uh, in the direction parallel or anti-parallel to the main magnetic field. But, if, but in this equilibrium state, there is uh, the nuclei is producing uh, no useful signal to form an image. And here is where the radio frequency field comes in. Uh, this field is produced by a set of coils, and this is applied perpendicular to the main magnetic field. And uh, the radio frequency field perturbs or tips the magnetization out of the equilibrium state uh, in a process called excitation. And when the radio frequency field is no longer being applied, the nuclei uh, processes back into alignment to the main magnetic field, 
in a process called relaxation. But then uh, after this process of excitation and relaxation, there's still no way to determine the signal in a specific location. And here is where the magnetic field gradients come in. And I will not go farther because I will focus only in the radio frequency field and in the transmitted magnetic field, uh, B1 plus or V1 for sure. And, and all these fields are, are not homogeneous and they introduce non-uniformities, which brings about direct consequences to the quality of the image. And therefore it is important to quantify these magnetic fields or gradients. And this takes us to establish what is V1 mapping. Uh, V1 mapping is to measure the relative or absolute values of the radio frequency field uh, to know the spatial distribution of the transmitted radio frequency field in this case. And V1 mapping aims to define an MRI parameter which varies spatially across an image. And the flip angle is frequently taken as a direct measure of the V1 field because the flip angle is a function of the strength of the, of the V1 field. But uh, the flip angle and the V1 field are directly proportional in cases of non slab or non slice selective methods. Otherwise, the relationship between the flip angle and the V1 field is more complicated. Also, this is often ignored. And V1 mapping fulfills uh, a wide range of applications, such as the quality control of radio frequency coils or testing the MR compatibility of planted objects. We have problems with the connection. I think it's good now, but I, I also was locked out for, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds. Okay. Uh, so this uh, and uniformities of the V1 field introduce variations or are caused by variations in the V1 field. And this causes signal intensity variations across the space, and uncorrected variations in signal intensity also leads to variations in some quantitative metrics. And this is one potential reason so to perform B1 mapping. And there are several um, methods proposed to for B1 mapping. And here we only focus on the actual flip angle imaging. Uh, the pulse sequence consists of two identical ray frequency pulses at an excitation flip angle of alpha, followed by two uh, delays of different duration, TR1 and TR2. And these two repetition times are subject to this relation where N is the ratio of the TR2 to TR1. And, and then after each radio frequency pulse, the signal is acquired. And it is also assumed that, that the relaxation time effects are non negligible and that the train of radio frequency pulses applied uh, are applied uh, fast, thus establishing a pulse steady state of magnetization. And it is also assumed that the signal uh, is completely spoiled after the signal is fired. And it's been shown that if the time repetition in the if the repetition times are sufficiently short uh, and that the signal is ideally spoiled, the ratio of the signals the ratio R of signal two to signal one is dependent on the flip angle. But this is just an approximation of a more complete analytical equation that we are about to see. Uh, this is the complete analytical equation. This is for signal one and the equation for signal two is pretty much similar. Capital E and two corresponds to the exponential decays of the repetition time one and two. And this is how the plots look like of the normalized signal as a function of the excitation flip angle for three different T1 values and for these repetition times, 30 milliseconds for turn repetition one and was fixed to five. And because of this relation, TR2 is 150 milliseconds. As part of our contribution, we have made, using Plotly, we have made these plots interactive. And this is the result with it. when in this plot, uh, we are showing three different T1 values. Uh, 
characterized by, by its color. The solid line corresponds to signal number one and the dashed line corresponds to signal number two. Here, uh, one or the user can interact with this plot by changing the repetition time value from five to eight in this case, uh, gaining much more information than just showing this only this single TR1 value. But here we can, we are able to show much more information, which I think is really important. Uh, and then we also know that the analytical equation is assuming that the longitudinal magnetization has reached steady state after a certain number of repetition times, which is usually long. And also that the transverse magnetization is completely spoiled as after each repetition time. Uh, because to fulfill these conditions is a real challenge in practice. We have added a module to run block simulations in order to provide more reasonable estimates about the signal when, when the signal, for instance, has not, has not reached the steady state. And here we can see that um, at, at a few number of repetition times, there is a large deviation between the block simulation and the analytical equation. The block simulation is the solid line and the dashed line is the analytical equation. In blue is signal one and in red is signal two. Uh, and we can see that uh, this not only depends on the repetition times, but also on the excitation flip angle, as we can see here. And also the block simulations are useful to see uh, the effect of different spoiling. Here I want to point out that these curves in the right correspond to signal number one only. The blue line corresponds to the signal ideally spoiled. The green curve corresponds to the signal with no spoiling at all. And we can see that between these two curves, after, even after applying a large number of repetition times, uh, these signals are not similar. And in fact, are very, very different. But when a gradient and radio frequency spoiling is applied, uh, there is more similarities between the, the ideal to, to the signal when spoiling is applied. And again, this also depends on the excitation flip angle. And all of these equations and all of these plots that we're trying to reproduce come from this paper from Vasily L. Dernick, which was, which was published, published in 2007. Uh, just to recall, the ratio R is the ratio of the signal two to signal one. Uh, and we have two versions of it. First, we have a complete analytical equation, which is a com which seems a complicated equation. But after applying a Taylor expansion to the, to the exponential, and after keeping only the first order terms, we got this approximation. If we solve for the flip angle, we obtain the distribution of the flip angles as a function of the ratio of the signals R, and as a function of the ratio N, which is the ratio of the repetition sign. And this is an approximation, and this should provide sufficient uh, accuracy to the analytical equation. Uh, and this should provide sufficient, sufficient accuracy to a wide range of time repetition of repetition times and to a range of relaxation times. And again, these are the plots is displayed in the original paper. Uh, once again, we have made this plot interactive to show more than 31 values, for instance. And this is the result. Again, here the user can change the value of the relaxation time to one. And just notice there is a large differences between the analytical in blue and the approximation in orange. And we can see that these differences are more pronounced for short to one values and for high excitation flip angles. And the AFI is considered to be T1 insensitive to a wide range of T1 values because after 200 milliseconds, there is only a slight deviation at high excitation flip angles. And then to study the effects of timing parameters, we have fixed the T1 value to 900 milliseconds in ratio N to five. The user again can change the value of the repetition time one. And here we can see also a slight deviation from the analytical and the approximation at high excitation 
at high excitation sleep angle and at long repetition times. And at the end, the effect of the ratio M, we can see that N is the main parameter affecting the sensitivity of the AFI method. That is, if we increase the N, the if we increase the value of N, the variability of R increases too, to a wide range of excitation sleep angles. But we cannot increase uh, the ratio N without a limit due to scan time, scan time constraints. And finally, this is an in vivo application. I believe Matthew acquired this data. Uh, here I showed the input data, signal one and signal two. This is the film map, V1 film map. This was calculated as the ratio of the distribution of the actual flip angle to the nominal flip angle, which in, which in this case was set to 60 degrees. Uh, and yes, I'm, now I would like to share um, my experience and the challenges as I faced to implement this method. Uh, first, in the repository, in the QMR lab repository, uh, I found this wiki page, which contains not only information about how to add a new model, but also information about how to upload a sample data, for instance, information about the graphical user interface or rules uh, to, to implement a new method, rules to name classes, functions, variables, methods. And then uh, when I went to this guideline to, uh, to add a new model, what I first saw was how to install the QMR lab using Git. And what I really like about this wiki page is that uh, all over the website, there are uh, several references to information that can, that can be uh, useful and handy at some moment. Uh, and then I came up with this recipe to add a new model. This recipe, as I call it, uh, is a total of 12 steps. I think uh, the information is well structured and synthesized. It is not too dense, it is easy to follow. Uh, and they provide a standardized way to start with a model, to start to add a new model. You only need to customize this recipe, uh, in this case to AFI. So we have to define the, the method, uh, some commands, uh, link to the sample data, set the properties and functions to the method, and then to ensure that the method is working well. And you should really follow this uh, recipe because we were having a bug that I didn't have any idea what was causing it. Matthew managed to solve it. And the reason I was skipping one of these <laughs> last steps, so you, you should really follow this recipe. And also what I found in this wiki page is a couple of links that don't contain any information at all. I suspect, for instance, this section, adding fit function for the model, I suspect that this information is already available somewhere else. And of course, it, this did not uh, interfere in to add a new model. Uh, and I know if you are considering to like to clean up some of the links, I don't know. And yet once I read this recipe, once I read the instruction, uh, as it is stated in the wiki page, now it was time to get my hands dirty. So we defined the method, we defined the properties and the functions of the method. And the code we wrote was the code regarding to the fit function. We fit the data, we wrote the AFI equations, and also we have to write the functions for the analytical solution and for the block simulation. And the applications, we, we use several applications and software. So for, first we wrote the code in MATLAB, a sort of tape can also be used. And then we shared this code using Git and GitHub. For me, this was the most difficult step because at first I didn't even know the difference between Git and GitHub. I remember well the first time I met Aga and Matthew, they explained this to me and they gave me a short tutorial and they provided me with further reading, documentation, and a video tutorial. And by the way, I was forgetting to mention that um, it could be really cool if, it would be really cool if you shared that video tutorial and that documentation in the wiki page, because it could, it, it is very, it was very useful to me. 
Uh, and at first, when I was about to push my first contribution, uh, I was afraid of messing something up in the repository. But fortunately, everything went well. And Git Kraken really made my life easier. By then, uh, Matthew had shared data. Uh, he uploaded the sample data to the Open Science Framework. So now we had uh, the code written. Once the, the code and the and data were publicly available, we prepared a Jupyter notebook. This was to make an interactive tutorial so the user can know the method. And I think the user can know the method in a fun way because he can interact with the live code. He can see equations there. He can modify some parameters. And with Plowly, he can interact with, uh, with the figures. And, and this is, I think, again, I, I, I would like to repeat that with an interactive plot, we are gaining much more information. Uh, we expand our knowledge, not only on data, but also in the method. And, and also we wanted to make this analysis reproducible, uh, but because not everyone has the same piece of software for the same version, the Jupyter Notebook uh, is not enough. So we have to create an environment to wrap up a piece of code or software, on this case, the Jupyter Notebook. And then we share this environment. Uh, and at this moment now, everyone has the same software, the same code and, and the same data. Uh, and if we want to go a step further, uh, we can use Binder, which is a nice way. It is, this is a nice project, I think, to make the code reproducible by anyone, uh, anywhere. And I was impressed how, once you have the, the Jupyter Notebook, how easy it is to use this project. You only need to specify the repository. If applicable, you specify the git branch, the tag, or commit. You click the launch button, and it, it is just a matter of minutes, and you got your Jupyter your, your, your Notebook runnable. Here is an example of this, the Jupyter Notebook of this interactive tutorial for the AFI. Uh, here's the introduction. Uh, we load the libraries. Then we set some theory equation. We set the QMR lab path. We start QMR lab. We use the functions of QMR lab and with Plotly, we create these interactive figures. Uh, this is the first one I showed you. And uh, we want to make this, uh, this Jupyter notebook. We want to publish this Jupyter notebook in the QMR lab website. I think it is almost ready. Uh, and it was possible to use not only Python, but also Octave by adding a Docker file. So Jupyter Notebook can work with, uh, with Octave in this case. And yes, this is only the ratios R that I, that I already showed you that are now available in this Jupyter Notebook. You can run it if you want. Um, and just to summarize, what we have done. We have implemented a new method, a new big mapping method, the AFI, on the QR lab software. We have written the code in MATLAB. We have shared the code and data. Uh, we prepare an interactive tutorial so that the user can know about this method in a fun way, I think. And we make this analysis reproducible by containerizing these applications or this piece of code. And this is uh, a really good way to make this analysis reproducible anywhere. You don't need to have installed any software. You only need the repository and go to my binder and run the Jupyter Notebook. Um, and yes, finally, I would like to thank Matthew because he has always been very supportive. He always helped me uh, to solve some issues involved in the code. He provided constant feedback and advice to Matthew and Naga because they introduced me to Git and GitHub. They provided, they provided me with some tutorials and to Dr. Nicholas Ticke for uh, giving me the chance to implement this method on the QMR lab. 